Good evening. You're watching Arirang News at 8. It's Tuesday, January 21st here in Korea. Live from Seoul, I am Yu ji -hae. We begin this evening with the latest on the bird flu outbreak here in Korea. The number of confirmed cases is growing, raising fears that the virus may have already spread nationwide. And meanwhile, more than 200,000 chickens and ducks in the southwest of the country have been slaughtered. Our Kwon Sola has the latest. Fears of a nationwide bird flu outbreak in Korea are growing. Disease prevention authorities said Tuesday that they suspect a duck farm in the southern city of Cheongup in Tollabukdo province has been infected with avian influenza. If their suspicions prove true, it would be the first case of AI outside of Gochang and Puan counties, the source of the recent AI outbreaks, and would mean that the risk of birds carrying the virus to other places has increased. With that in mind, the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs announced Tuesday that all ducks within a three-kilometer radius of the infected farms will be culled. That's a much wider area than the 500-meter radius set earlier, but for now, the order excludes chicken. Earlier in the day, authorities confirmed that the number of poultry farms in Buan and Gochang that have ducks infected with the highly pathogenic H5N8 strain of avian influenza has risen to four. The same strain of the virus was confirmed in a group of wild ducks found dead in a reservoir near a poultry farm in Kochang on Monday. Officials say this, as well as several more suspicious cases, including a recent one on Jeju Island, increases the chance that migratory ducks are the source of the bird flu outbreak. More specifically, they are pointing to a type of duck called the Baikal teal, which fly in from Russia to Korea for the winter. Korea has a total of 37 wintering sites for migratory birds. The Ministry of Environment has said it will track the Baikal teal's route via GPS to calculate the possibility of a further virus spread. Meanwhile, sales of poultry products have dropped significantly over the last couple of days, which is raising concerns in the distribution industry ahead of the Lunar New Year holiday. Health authorities say, however, that there is a very slim chance that the infected products have or will enter the market, and even if they do, the virus is destroyed once cooked at 75 degrees Celsius for at least five minutes. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And over now to the worst ever data leak in Korean history. While the country's financial institutions in question are struggling to placate thousands of angry customers, the government is set to unveil countermeasures to prevent a recurrence. Our Jim Young-gil reports. Thousands of angry customers swarmed into their banks for a second straight day on Tuesday to get their credit card details changed and to file complaints about the credit card firm's mismanagement of their personal information. Their actions follow in the wake of what has become one of the biggest information leaks in the nation's history, with up to 20 million people in Korea having been affected. I've been waiting here for more than an hour, and I'm dumbfounded by the whole situation. Financial institutions are responsible for protecting our assets and personal information, not leaking it. They should compensate for any damages that customers may incur. Concerns arising that customers' information may have fallen into the hands of scammers, with reports emerging that suspicious and unintended financial transactions have been made on accounts. The leak is one of the worst in the country's history, with the personal data, bank account details, addresses and credit ratings of millions of people now out in the open. The three card firms, KB Kumin Card, NH Nongyap Card and Lotte Card said they will fully cover any financial losses suffered by their customers from scams linked to the data leak. On Wednesday, the government will announce a set of preventive measures to stop similar data leaks from occurring as well as toughened penalties for those involved in leaking data. These are expected to include stronger monitoring of staff at financial companies involved in customer data management, tougher regulations to prevent financial firms from sharing client data with their affiliates, and stronger punitive measures on financial institutions and their executives in case of data leaks. This information leak comes less than one month after the personal data of some 130,000 Standard Chartered Bank Korea and Citibank Korea customers was stolen. Jim Young-gil, Arirang News. 
And the number of bogus websites pretending to be financial agencies has jumped 79-fold in just two years. The Korea Internet and Security Agency says the total of websites that do people into revealing their bank or credit card information in the January to November period last year was over 5,800 compared to 74 in 2011. The number is up nearly 40 percent from a year ago. The KISA official advised users not to connect to unidentified links on social media sites and avoid making micropayments. Foreign experts take on this massive security breach that has spooked the Korean public. We go one on one with Dr. Kim Byung Joo, head of KLMP Consulting and a longtime commentator on Arirang News. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. So, reportedly, some 20 million card users in Korea, which is about one fifth of the total population, mm. has been affected by the latest data leak. Now, can you walk us through and tell us more about the scope? of this breach? For sure, the scope includes the person that you're talking to right at this point, and it looks, looks like someone, you know, everybody that we know have mm -hmm. been affected. And the way this is happening is, uh, you know, of course, the root of the story is this person who is working for the credit uh, evaluation agency just got hold of this uh, personal data and uh, took it out of the, uh, the credit companies and they shared it with other uh, entities. And that is the, the story itself. And now there are a lot of people are asking, you know, if this has to do with three credit card companies, how can this be so extensive? The thing is the Korean practice where this kind of uh, financial information, uh, of course personal information, is widely shared within financial groups actually. When uh, a company of uh, financial services, a company that provides uh, financial services gets, help, gets hold of uh, you know, information, personal information, they tend to be uh, widely shared throughout the financial group itself. And even through the credit rating, rating agencies and others, these are all shared with other credit related service companies as well. So there are some critics who are saying, well, now we are talking about the, the users of these credit, uh, three credit cards company uh, credit cards, but actually the, the scope and extent could be even wider than what government is talking about. So this has a lot to do with the overall Korean practice mm -hmm. where personal information has been just shared and commoditized and sold uh, without, uh, well, of course, our, our own consents, consents, but consent, but we didn't really have a choice. You know, we just had to agree to that for financial transactions and so on, and that information has been just widely shared, and that's the reason why the scope itself is so extensive. See, well, Korea's financial watchdog has assured that information was leaked but was not circulated. Mm -hmm. What does that mean by that? Yeah, leaked means that uh, the information package went uh, cut outside of these companies, right? So that's that's leak. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, uh, there the government is adamant that it has not been circulated, widely used and widely shared with other uh, entities. But uh, critics are saying that's not something we can be sure of at this point. And we will find out more and more of these cases uh, as time goes on. At this point, government is saying they got a hold of this criminal and they got the data so that it's secure. A lot of critics are saying that is something that government has to say in order to deal with the public panic itself. And otherwise, if co government acknowledges possibilities of being, uh, this information being circulated, there will be a great public up, uh, uproar. So government should be afraid of that. And now we will find out you know, whether that's 100% true or not in coming days. And if this is not the case, then we will get to see uh, you know, different kinds of abuses. In the case of uh, knowing up uh, NH credit card and Lotte credit card, credit card number together with expiration date have been uh, you know, leaked. So that means in f uh, overseas sites, a lot of uh, cases, you can actually make a transaction. Mm -hmm. With this information, you can buy goods. So we will find out whether those w uh, such cases will be materialized or not. And the greatest, greatest fear is the, the second, uh, second news or second round of violations where uh, you know, these people who does vo voice fishing, smishing, and farming could actually use this data and create a lot of mess. So we'll, we'll uh, get to see what the extent of this trouble itself will be. Mm. A more worrying sign is that the majority of financial firms were not even aware of these leaks right. uh, for over a year mm. um, until the prosecution began the recent investigation. Right. Mm -hmm. How can that be possible? And does that mean there are more of these cases? Well, of course, you know, they should have a system to regularly check this kind of criminal activities. But because this was a criminal activity, mm. uh, I think in, in a way it makes sense that these companies didn't no, of course they have to have much safer system in place. So for that, uh, you know, for being 
blamed for this kind of violations. Of course, we saw like yesterday all these heads of the financial companies being rolled, and a lot of people just resigned. And there, the companies are saying they are going to actually, uh, you know, compensate any kind of loss that could be resulting from this kind of violation in the future. But now critics are saying, how can we be sure of that? Because the victims will have to actually prove these kind of damages uh, result have resulted from this kind of leak. When we have this extensive uh, use and sharing of this, this information all around the society, how can we actually prove at the court? So there is a certain sense of uh, desperation and, and frustration. So we'll have to wait and see how this all goes. Uh, the, these uh, chief executives losing their uh, positions and getting kicked out of these companies, the critics are saying, well, is this the, reason, is this the really right timing for uh, doing that? Because mm -hmm. somebody has to take care of the overall situation. And when those top people go, who's going to take care of this situation? So overall, it looks like the overall reaction here is uh, that of a panic rather than reason. Do you think it's possible that we can contain the damage? And uh, because we know that the government is set to announce countermeasures on mm -hmm. Wednesday, right. but will that be enough? Well, we'll have to wait and see about those specific measures that will be uh, announced. But uh, overall, I think the root cause of this problem has to do with our practice that we have maintained in this society so far. That is kind of commoditization of personal information. You know, when you have to, when you buy something through the online here, often, uh, you know, you cannot use your credit card unless you agree for sharing your information being shared with other entities. And you don't, when you buy something, you don't have time to check every uh, single fine point. And even if you check your fine point and you don't agree with that, uh, you know, unless you agree with those kind of causes for sharing clauses, you cannot do this kind of transaction. So it's not, it's not giving choice to consumers. So that kind of bad practice needs to be stopped once and for all. And uh, we are uh, hoping for lawmakers actually introducing new kind of laws, actually giving people choice for their information to be shared with other entities or not when they do this kind of transaction. So we'll have to wait and see on that one. So that means we need more fundamental change other than, uh, rather than just this kind of stopgap measures. All right, Dr. Kim, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Touch base with journalists, experts, and analysts who are taking the pulse of Asia's heartbeat. South Korea's defense minister. In a lively half hour, join Arirang's Yu Ji Hae for the day's top stories current affairs, business, technology trends, plus global weather forecasts, and more. Arirang News. Every weeknight, live on Arirang TV. And taking you now to Switzerland, where President Park Geun-hye is on her state visit. The Korean leader and her Swiss counterpart held a summit on Wednesday, Monday, where the two sides pledged to work together to realize a so-called creative economy through technological cooperation and by fostering specialized personnel. Our presidential office correspondent, Oh jin -ju, reports from Bern. Cooperation in the sectors of industrial technology and education dominated summit talks Monday between President Peck and President of the Swiss Confederation Didier Burkhalter. The two leaders recognized the need to couple Switzerland's top-notch technology and precision machinery, chemical, nano and bio industries with Korea's advanced manufacturing skills, a crucial point of cooperation in realizing the so-called creative economy. Out of the 11 MOUs and one agreement that were signed during the President's state visit, three were on technology cooperation. President Peck also sought ways to harness the strengths of Korean and Swiss education to foster specialized personnel that can work well within the creative economy. Switzerland is well known for its educational system, which is based heavily on apprenticeship. Most high school students are trained in vocational schools called Berushale, where they spend three to four days a week in companies to gain experience in industrial settings. An MOU was signed between the two nations to provide opportunities for graduates of Korea's vocational high schools or Meister schools employed in Swiss companies operating in Korea to receive vocational training in Switzerland for a year. 
There are also a number of MOUs signed to boost trade and investment, including a social security agreement that would relieve Korean and Swiss employees working in each other's countries from double taxation. It wasn't just the economic topics that topped the summit agenda. The Swiss leader promised to throw full support behind Seoul's efforts to maintain stability on the Korean peninsula and persuade North Korea to denuclearize. Oh Jin Ju, Arirang News, Bern. And back here in the nation, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State William Burns, who is in Seoul to discuss challenges posed by the North Korean leadership, expressed concerns about Pyongyang's recent peace offensive, as it could be an early indicator of provocations to come. Our Hwang Sung Hee has more. North Korea has seemingly been on a peace offensive in the new year. But visiting U.S. Deputy Secretary of State William Burns says the regime's tendency to have a sudden change of heart worries Washington. Well, I think uh, the United States and our friends uh, here in the Republic of Korea share a lot of concern about the recent behavior of the DPRK leadership and the, uh, the dangers of further reckless behavior and provocation in the future, as I said. There was a dramatic change in Pyongyang's attitude towards Seoul after North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's once powerful uncle, Chang sung tae was executed late last year. Following its proposal last week to end all cross-border slandering, Pyongyang has persistently expressed a strong will to improve inter-Korean ties. South Korea scoffed at the offer, with President Park Geun-hye telling the government to remain vigilant as the North engages in its propaganda offensive. After a meeting with South Korea's first vice foreign minister Kim Yoo-hyun in Seoul on Tuesday, Burns reaffirmed Washington's commitment to its ally. I express once again the strong American support for President Park's principled approach to the DPRK and stressed once again the strong American support for the defense and security of the Republic of Korea. And I would the U.S. diplomat is expected to discuss the current state of North Korea with officials in China before moving on to Japan, where the country's denials of historical wrongdoings will be taken up. Once Burns wraps up his trip, U.S. Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Daniel Russell, who will accompany Burns in China and Japan, will visit Seoul on Sunday to share the results of the discussions in Beijing and Tokyo. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. And staying with North Korea's peace offensive, South Korea's unification minister, Ryu Gil-jae, has outright dismissed Pyongyang's proposal to end all cross-border hostilities and provocations, saying the offer does not make logical sense. Speaking at a reunification-related forum on Tuesday, Ryu said North Korea made the proposal last week, knowing full well that South Korea could not accept it. Instead, Ryu called on the need to resume reunions of families separated during the Korean War, which Pyongyang had had unilaterally called off at the last minute in September. It seems the Syria peace talks in Switzerland will go ahead as planned after all. The main opposition group in Syria, which threatened to pull out of the meeting after the UN invited Iran, has confirmed it will attend. This after the UN withdrew its controversial offer. Apak Chuan tells us more. U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon withdrew his invitation for Iran to attend the much-anticipated peace talks on Syria, set to begin in Switzerland this week, after Iran refused to accept a 2012 Geneva deal calling for a transitional government for Syria. The Secretary General is deeply disappointed by Iranian public statements today that are not at all consistent with that stated commitment. Given that it has chosen to remain outside that basic understanding, he has decided that the one-day Montreux gathering will proceed without Iran's participation. The UN's controversial last-minute decision to invite Iran had threatened to jeopardize the talks before they had even started, as Syria's main opposition group, the Syrian National Coalition, said it would not participate in the talks unless Iran, one of the Assad regime's major backers, was disinvited, and Tehran stopped exerting a military influence over Syria. After the U.N. withdrew Iran's invitation, the Syrian National Coalition confirmed its participation at the peace talks. The National Coalition welcomes the decision of the Secretary-General of the United Nations 
Mr. Ban Ki-moon, uh, in withdrawing the invitation that was sent to Iran. Uh, the National Coalition also would like to confirm uh, its attendance to uh, Geneva II conference and its participation in it. The peace talks involving some 30 countries are scheduled to begin Wednesday in Montreux, Switzerland. On Friday, talks between the Syrian government and opposition delegations will continue in Geneva. More than 100,000 people have been killed and millions more displaced since the Syrian conflict broke out some three years ago. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Iran began shutting down its most sensitive nuclear operations as part of its preliminary nuclear deal with world powers, which immediately responded by lifting sanctions. Korea was no exception. It will resume oil imports that stopped in July last year. Our Shin Se-min reports. Korea will no longer have to cut its purchases of crude oil from Iran after the European Union and the United States suspended a range of sanctions on the Middle Eastern country on Monday. Korea is one of the countries to be eligible for Iran's sanction exceptions under the U.S. National Defense Authorization Act. Korea depends on imports for its oil needs and Iran is a major supplier. The East sanctions will also allow Seoul to import petrochemicals and export automobile parts that have been banned since last July. The move is expected to bring Korean companies about 100 million U.S. dollars. The International Atomic Energy Agency confirmed Monday that Iran has begun shutting down parts of its nuclear program. The agency said that Tehran has stopped production of uranium with a concentration of above 5 percent and had begun diluting its stockpile of 20 percent enriched uranium. Iran can now benefit from the easing of sanctions worth up to $7 billion, including recovering frozen oil revenues worth some $4.2 billion. The East sanctions will only be effective for six months, giving the world powers time to negotiate a final deal with Iran. The action eases the restrictions on trade in petrochemicals, gold and precious metals and on the provision of the insurance for oil shipments. The interim deal was struck in Geneva in November last year after months of talks between Iran and the five UN Security Council members and Germany. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. Korea's venture investments reached a record high last year, rising more than 12 percent compared to a year earlier. The Small and Medium Business Administration and the Korea Venture Capital Association announced Tuesday that investments in ventures reached 1.8 trillion won, or roughly 1.4 billion U.S. dollars in 2013. Now that's the highest level since 2011. Uh, 2001, that is, and is up by 99 percent compared to 2012. An SMB official attributed the rise to the Park Geun-hye administration's drive to push for a more efficient framework for startups. The world's largest brewer, Enhauser Bushenbev, says it will pay 5.8 billion U.S. dollars to buy back Korea's leading beer company, OB. Industry watchers expect the buyout to further intensify competition in the local beer market. Our Connie Kim reports. Belgian Brazilian multinational brewer Anheuser Busch and Bev has bought back Korea's top selling beer brand, Oriental Brewery, from KKR and Affinity Equity Partners as it moves to boost sales in the Asia Pacific region. AB and Bev struck a 5.8 billion US dollar deal on Monday with KKR and Affinity, buying OB back for three times more than the summit got when it sold the Korean company to the private equity firm in 2009. Industry analysts say, however, that the huge outlay is a reasonable price for AB and Bev, as OB now accounts for more than 60 percent of total beer sales in the nation, up from 40 percent four years ago. AB and Bev, the world's leading brewer, has a relatively small presence in the Asia-Pacific region, taking up less than 15 percent of total beer sales in the area in 2012. It said Korea is an attractive beer market with strong potential to grow, given that the Korean beer market grows at 2 percent annually. Analysts also noted the fast growth of imported beer market at 10 percent every year. They say the purchase of OB could mark AB and Bev start of a big push into the Asia-Pacific market, including China, where it could seek a buyout. OB surpassed height in 2011, and its leadership is expected to be cemented by AB and Bev's takeover. 
Obi and Haichin Ro now control 90% of Korea's beer market, but competition is expected to intensify with conglomerate Lotte Group set to enter the market this year. Connie Kim, Arirang News. And let's go over to our Kim Bo-kyung at the Weather Center for an update. Now, Bo-kyung, what's the latest? Good evening, ji Heavy snowfall advisories have been issued in the Gangwon-do and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces, as well as the mountains of Jeju. Taking a look at the current conditions, the east coast regions are under the influence of a low-pressure trough, which is why we're seeing clouds move in as snow. Now, a pre-find us warning was issued in Seoul, and numbers are saying that Seoul is seeing 141 micrograms per cubic meter of fine dust, which is about three times the normal levels. As for the snow, the Gangwon and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces could get about another five centimeters through later tonight. Other than that, temperatures will jump back to the seasonal average range starting tomorrow afternoon. Taking a closer look at tomorrow's readings, Seoul starts off the day at minus nine degrees with a high of two. Meanwhile, Daegu and Busan reach five and six degrees respectively. Moving on to other regions, Jeju makes it to 6 degrees, while Dokdo and Mount Gumgang peak at 3 and minus 4 degrees, respectively. Well, that's all I have for you this hour, and back to you, Jihye. Thanks, Po Gyeong. And that's a broadcast on this Tuesday evening. I'm Yu Jihye in Seoul. Thanks for watching.